Hello guys, in this video I'd like to give you a sneak preview of an upcoming diorama I have and then show you how I've been designing and 3D printing some details for that diorama. I'll be doing that 3D printing with a brand new Creality Ender 5S1 which was supplied to me for free by Creality. So we'll be putting that through its paces and seeing how well that might work for us as scale modelers. If you've been a viewer of the channel for a while, you would have seen this Ursat Stug and this Panther, which I built fairly recently. My diorama is going to involve a field repair workshop, which is converting those from German vehicles into the Ursat's uh, imitation American vehicles. And that's going to be set in a farmyard. Now there are plenty of injection molded detail kits, which I uh, could buy to support this and add details to this diorama. And I will be using a number of those. But I thought I would also have a go at designing and 3D printing some of my own details. Particularly as it turned out to be a bit easier than I thought. The program I found most useful for 3D design is Tinkercad, which is web based so there's nothing you need to install and it's entirely free to use. If you saw my recent YouTube short you will have seen a quick overview there of how I made a window frame and some panes to go inside it. So I'm going to pick up from that point and use some similar techniques to add some shutters. The key thing about Tinkercad is it's all about primitive shapes and adding or subtracting them from each other to make more complex shapes. So to start with my shutters I'm going to start with a cube and I'm going to change the size of that so that it is one millimeter high. So then it's 24 millimeters long. Sorry, that should be 34 millimeters long. And so that it's 12 millimeters wide, which is the same width as the window pane. I'm then going to take another cube and size it so that it goes within the first one with a one millimeter border around the outside. So in this case, it's going to be 32 millimeters in length, 10 millimeters in width. And I'm not really bothered about the height. In fact, I quite like the high height here because it, it illustrates the point a bit better. And I move that cube on the Z axis. So you can see that new cube there is going straight through the middle of the old cuboid shape and then click the button over there to make it a hole and what that will do is it will carve this away from the original shape. Now if I hold shift and click on the original frame so I've got both objects selected you can see in the top right it says two shapes selected and then I click on group and that applies the hole to the original shape and you can see we've got our um, window frame there. So that's a really powerful technique in Tinkercad and that's how I made the original window frame and the uh, panes that go inside it. What I want to make next is the actual slats of the shutter. So again I start with a cube. This time I'm going to make it one by one. And of course it needs to fit widthwise within the frame so it needs to be 10 millimeters wide. And you can see that fits there nicely. And then rotating, it's quite hard to click actually sometimes, so you can type the number directly. I'm rotating that by 45 degrees. Just so that it has that kind of angled look of a shutter. Then I can move it into position. I think there looks good. And then I'm just pressing Ctrl C and Ctrl V to paste many copies of that slat. I'm just moving them down into the correct position, like so. I'm cheating a bit here, but I'm selecting four together, Ctrl C, Ctrl V, copy them all at once, move them into the right position. until I've copied those slats all the way down to the bottom of that frame, like so. Perfect. You can see there that's nicely distributed and looks fairly decent. So 
So ideally I'd like those all to be one object. So what I can do is just draw a box around them, make sure I've got them all, and click group again. This time because they're solid, none of them are holes, there's no, um, no reduction done, they just get grouped into one shape. And if we move that over the window there, we can see that fits nicely. Perfect shutter over the top of our window. Copy and paste it. And there we go. Okay, let's move on to the next object. Okay, so the next object I want to make is a piece of guttering. To do that, we're going to start with another primitive, this time a half cylinder. Put it onto the work surface and rotate it 90 degrees, sorry, 180 degrees, so that it is facing the right way. And then resize it to be a bit more appropriate. So I want my drain pipe to be about 5 millimeter wide, 60 millimeters long, and I think 4 millimeters high is good. So that's our solid drain pipe there, 5 wide, 60 long and 4 high. Now I want to use a similar technique to the previous example to carve out the middle of that guttering. So I bring another half cylinder in, rotate it 180 again, shrink it down, and this needs to be 2 millimeters uh, narrower than the original shape because the original shape needs to be 1 millimeter thick all the way around. So I make this 3 wide, 60 long still, and I make it three high, like so. We can then move it up a millimeter on the Z axis so that its top aligns with the top of the original shape. Then we move the new shape over the original and you can see it fits nicely inside it with that one mil edge all the way around. Okay, same process now as before, select the inner shape, go to hole, you can see there it's turned out slightly grey colour, it hasn't done anything yet, but we can see what it's going to do. Then we shift click on the outer shape, so we've got both selected, we can see on the top right there it says two shapes selected. Then go up to group, And it cuts the inner shape from the outer shape and gives us a lovely guttering piece. Now what we really need for our guttering is some kind of bracket, um, both in terms of detail and in terms of practicality to actually let us attach it to our building. So remember that the gutter is 5 wide, 4 high and 60 deep. We start again with another half cylinder, we rotate it 180 degrees again, and this time we're going to have to make it 7mm wide because it's going to go on the outside of that original guttering piece which was 5mm and it needs 1mm each side, so 7 in total. It's only going to be 1mm deep. And it, again, it has to be slightly bigger than the original drain type pipe in terms of the height. So it's going to have to be 5 millimeters. I've made it 4 millimeters here. I fix that in a moment. Then we take a yet another half cylinder, rotate it 180 degrees. You probably guess what I'm doing by now. I'm going to make this one ever so slightly smaller than the original shape so I can carve this out of the original. So this one's going to go all the way down to be. Uh, three millimeters. This is where I fix it and make the original one five again. There we go. And of course that inner one needs to be uh, 5, doesn't it? I got the, there we go, 5 millimeters. Okay, 
Now we can shift the inner one up on the z-axis. Make it a hole, move it across. And again, you can see where I'm going with this now. Shift click, two selected, group them. Beautiful stuff. We've now got a little bracket which should fit perfectly on the outside of that original guttering which it does there, and then we just shift it down a millimetre on the z-axis. Beautiful. So as you can see, it is relatively simple. As long as you get the um, measurements in your head correct, which I, I didn't quite then, it's quite a simple way of um, subtracting shapes to make things. Of course, we can also add shapes, and it would be nice if our um, bracket had a handle. So I'm going to start with a big cube. I'm going to bring it down to a millimetre deep, a millimeter high and about six millimeters long. Now I'm going to move that into position, so up on the Z axis. It's not quite the right place. And one over the top there. Now, if we just put it up here to the bracket and we zoom in, you can see we've got a bit of a gap there where the curved edge meets the flat edge, which is not good. That's going to be either a print failure or it will just be a very weak point. So we'll move it across so the two overlap. That's absolutely fine. The join will take care of those overlaps. The, the printer won't try and print two things in one space or anything like that. So overlap them. Click on the handle, click shift click on the actual bracket itself. So we've got two shapes selected. This time just group them. No need to make a hole. And you can see there we've got a more complex shape. And that again should go over the end of our guttering. I think I'm moving in a few millimeters, that looks better. Yeah, nice little job. And of course we can shift click on the guttering and the bracket, group them together to make one overall shape. Okay, let's have a crack at making something a bit more complicated. I would really like a water trough or a, a food trough or something for my farm. So I'm going to start again, a bit like the drain pipe, a bit like the guttering rather, with a half cylinder. This time, of course, I'm going to make it quite a lot bigger. So to get the size I wanted, I basically estimated the real life size and then divided that by 35, because I want 1 35th scale. Some reference photos always help in situations like this too. And this is what I came out with. Here I'm using the same principle as I did with the gutter, which is to make a second half cylinder slightly smaller than the original. In this case, instead of uh, making a new half cylinder, I've just copied the original and shrunk it down slightly. So I want a one mil gap on each side and I want a slightly bigger gap at the ends. And of course don't forget to reduce the height. There we go, so if we move those over each other I wasn't happy at this stage, I thought the uh, one millimetre gap at the end was a bit thin. So I shrunk it down another couple of mil. And you probably remember the process by now. We've got the inner shape selected, we need to make that a hole. Shift click on the outer shape, group them together, bang, we've got our shape there. So already that's quite a nice little trough on its own but I'd like a few details to be added. Um, and we're going to start with something to, um, to support it. So we'll take a cube again. This is basically just going to be a block of concrete or something to support it there. Shrink its size down. That looks about right, I think, for the width and the height there. Just double checking the sizes there to compare them.
and that there looks like that's a good size more or less for our stand it's not quite even there we go now of course we have a small problem there because that red piece is uh, in the middle there of our trough which we don't want so how do we fix that we can make another half cylinder just the same as our original half cylinder before we did any cutting away position that over our concrete support make the half cylinder a hole shift click on the concrete support group those two together and there we go we've got our support shape there now we can copy and paste that obviously they're identical because they copy and pasted and we can just move them over the trough there I'm just lining them up first of all in the right place about there move them over the trough and if you get them in the wrong place you'll see part of the red sticking into the trough so you know you're wrong and there we go that's looking pretty decent isn't it I haven't actually positioned that perfectly there because the gap on one side is bigger than the other but I'll fix that later Right, now to make some bars that go across the top of the trough. I'll start with the cylinder, rotate it 90 degrees onto its side, and shrink it right down so that it's only a millimeter in um, diameter. There we go. This needs to be the same width as the trough. So that was 14 mil. Shift it up on the Z axis so it's the right height. Just double check that, it's a bit too high. Down, down, down. There we go. That's good. And then move it across into position. Again, a bit like the handle with the um, gutter bracket. You can see here this overlaps, but that is absolutely fine. That's not a problem at all. When we group those together, that will sort that out. Copy and paste it, maybe put a second one here at the end. Just deciding here where I want them. And a third one, like so. And the final part of the process, select the three bars there, shift click in each one, shift click on the trough itself, and group them together. There we go. And again, I just noticed there that those supports are not quite in the right place. They need to be slightly to the left. There we go, that's better. And the same for the second one at the back. There, that's better. Once that's done, we can export those models as STL files put them into some software to prepare them for the 3D printer. So in this case, it will be the Creality Slicer. Then we export from the slicer onto a USB stick and plug that into the printer. So I set my models printing on the 3D printer. At first I made a small mistake and I accidentally left the print setting on RAF, which creates this base that you can see there around the model to help it stick better to the build plate. That's fine, it's really useful for some models, but uh, because these models are flat and they generally are in contact with the build plate anyway, they probably don't need a raft and it can make them harder to remove because you have to remove it from that raft. So I did print them again later without the raft, I just didn't film it. So let's see what we've got. 
Well, this is my window frame. As you can see, that uh, one millimeter inset piece there has come out rather nicely. It's well defined and clear, and hopefully that should provide a space for the frames to sit inside. The back of the print doesn't look great, but that is a consequence of it being flat on the uh, print bed. And of course that doesn't really matter because that's going to be facing away um, from the front of the model, it's going to be hidden inside the model. We also have these shutters here, this is the front side, which looks fairly decent. There's a bit of texture that's not supposed to be there, it's not designed as part of the model. The back again, of course, doesn't look great, but no problem for the same reason. But the texture on the front is really just a result of the, uh, the process of FDM printing. As we can see, the shutters do fit well into the frame, perhaps ever so slightly tight, but maybe only a fraction of a millimetre or so. I think they look fairly decent. In this case, I think that FDM printing texture could pass off as um, wood grain or something similar, although perhaps in other situations it might be less desirable. Here are the individual window frames, which as you can see are much finer. Again, they go fairly well into the overall frame. They could perhaps do with a bit of sanding top and bottom just to smooth them out and make them fit. Again, they're not as crisp or squared off as you would expect a resin print to be, but they're not terrible. I think primed and painted up, they could look quite decent. If we fit them into our XPS foam building, a quite a tight fit. I did measure very, very tightly there. I think they look pretty decent as a frame. And of course, by printing them myself, I've guaranteed that I've got something the exact right size for my windows. There's our shutters. So this is the version of the shutter that I built with a solid um, back on it. I know the one I showed you in Tinkercad had uh, see-through slats, but I don't want to be able to see through into this building. So I put a solid piece of material behind them to stop me seeing through them. Okay, this build plate here contains our trough, our guttering, a piece of solid downpipe that I uh, designed, and a second piece of guttering. You'll notice one of those pieces I've printed facing upwards and one I've printed facing downwards. I just wanted to see which orientation would give the best result. These have been printed on a raft because I was having some issues with build plate adhesion. So I'll remove that raft now off camera. This is what we end up with for our trough. Now there's extra pieces in there, they're not anything to do with a print failure or anything. Those are pieces which were supporting the horizontal bars and we can just lightly remove those with a pair of tweezers or similar. There we go, so there's the trough. We can see obviously some evidence of layer lines at the bottom and to a certain extent on the sides as well. With FDM printing, horizontal surfaces tend not to come out so well. On the underside you can see there, again, right at the bottom it looks a bit ugly. Though of course that will be hidden. Overall it doesn't look too bad. So let's move on to the gutters. As I said I printed two pieces of this. This is the version which was printed um, upright, facing upward, so the normal way of guttering would be. And as you can see, it hasn't done a very good job here on this fine um, handle, this hook that we designed. Some of that might be support material, but still it's just not done a great job of the, uh, the layering there. On the other hand, this piece which was printed facing downwards, upside down, has done a much better job on the hook. But again, we do have the evidence there of the layer lines on the curve, and even the curve of the hook there is not brilliant. That needs a, a certain amount of filing and sanding to clean that up. But again, I think with some primer, some painting, and some weathering, the effects of those layer lines would probably be less visible. One more thing I printed which I didn't show you uh, in the design stage was this solid downpipe. So this is simply a cylinder with a hook similar to the guttering on the end. And again, we've had similar kind of problems to the guttering hook on this one here. It's nothing a sharp knife and a piece of sandpaper couldn't clean up. 
but again on the curves you can see the layer lines. The idea was this downpipe would join the uh, guttering like so with a connector piece that I haven't designed yet. Here we can see our guttering in position, so that hook just pushes into the foam and holds it into position. Let's just take the roof off temporarily. There we go. Put the roof back on. I think that looks pretty decent. Of course, we would have additional lengths of the guttering running side by side. I did print out a few other models to give the Ender 5 S1 a bit of a run. So this is the German fighter pilot model in 148 scale from Beacon Models. I've used this model because we know it's professionally designed, so it's quite high detail. I know it looked really good when it's well printed, so that will give us a good baseline to compare to in a moment. As you can see, this looks okay. I mean, if you look at the scale compared to my fingers, yes, you can see the layer lines, but they are um, quite small. If you compare that to my fingerprints, for example, and this is my macro lens, which does do a very good job of picking out detail. But here we can compare the same model with a resin printed version of it. I printed both of these myself. And you can see really there isn't a comparison between the FDM and the resin version. The resin just wins hands down on all kinds of uh, features there. It's much crisper, much sharper, and far fewer layer lines. However, to be fair, I am being a little bit mean on the, uh, the end of five here because, as I said, FDM printers are not really designed to print lots of small, fine detail. So I thought I'd print something a bit bulkier. This is a wargaming scale uh, ruined building, which I got from Thing Thingiverse. I'm going to remove the raft and the supports here off camera. This is what we're left with when I've done that. And it looks pretty decent. There is a small texture to the uh, vertical surface there, but nothing too bad. And of course, the texture on the brick wall there doesn't really matter if you've got layer lines in it because it sort of blends in with the texture itself. So that's uh, not such a problem. The inside looks good too. I can see this looking like a decent ruined building. The damaged areas of the brickwork have come out nicely. I think the roof tiles on top of the short wall have failed, but I think that was a bit of a fault with the original model. I did notice a bit of a gap um, in there, which is going to cause a problem for a 3D printer. But the rest looks pretty decent. Sticking with the theme of bigger models, which better suit the FDM printer, I went for this three-piece Rancor from Star Wars. I had a small print failure there where I accidentally broke off one of the uh, fingers, the claws, but that can be put back on. Here it is with the pieces put together, so of course the, the joints are my fault there, but the rest of the model looks quite decent, and I think of course with the texture of the monster in general, um, the layer lines are less, uh, less obvious, because it's a naturally imperfect surface anyway. You can see you've got a decent level of detail on the, uh, the horns, the spikes on the back, and the teeth as well have come out quite well. Finally, not modelling related, but I did print this handy mini watering can for my uh, houseplants. Of course, in an application like this, the quality doesn't matter so much provided it is watertight. Now I should say that all of the prints I've shown you so far were printed with the standard default quality setting in the Creality Slicer, which is a 0.2mm layer height. I did also try the super quality, which is the highest that the um, slicing software will go, which is 0.1 millimeters. And here you can see a comparison between the 0.1 millimeter layer height on the left and the 0.2 millimeter layer height on the right for that gutter piece. And I think it's fair to say that there is an improvement in quality there. The curve of the gutter does look smoother. Now, I would have really liked to have tried this super quality setting on other prints, um, but I simply couldn't really get it to work reliably. I tried it multiple times on the Beacon Pilot model, and it kept failing at the same point, and I'm not really sure why that is. 
The karate team did offer some advice, like level the print bed and uh, make sure the temperatures are fine, things like this. That's pretty standard 3D printing advice for an FDM printer, and it, none of it really helped. Now, I have seen people online who have reportedly used an even smaller layer height with this printer, um, but as I say, when I, when I tried the default settings in the software, um, you know, as a, a regular user would do, I, uh, I couldn't get it to work. So what do I think of this Ender 5 S1? Well, I think it's a really decent printer. It prints quickly, it's got a nice build volume, and in a way I feel like I've been a bit unfair by maybe trying this printer in an area which doesn't really suit FDM printing, which is um, small models and, and with lots of fine detail. But on the other hand, I didn't just want to give a general review of this printer, I wanted to see how it would suit me in this particular aspect of scale modeling. You know, I'm a scale modeling channel, I'm not a 3D printing channel. So I don't really care how good this printer is compared to other 3D printers. I care how good it is for the job that I want to do. And I think in that respect, it's not really suited at all for the kinds of models that I would personally print. And I think given the price point of 449 US dollars, you can get a very decent resin printer Yes, with all the, the sort of the hassle and the, um, the potential toxicity of the, the substances you use and so on that that entails, but you could get a resin printer for probably a bit less than this. So my personal preference would probably be for a resin printer. However, I can see how this FDM printer would be useful for certain aspects of scale modeling. So for example, if you were building quite large terrain pieces, I've got a friend who runs a, um, a Warhammer club for children and he builds their boards and their tiles using an FDM printer. And because they're a bit bigger, they come out quite nicely. And the you know, the kids have fun painting them and texturing them and things like this. So in that case for him, the resin printer probably wouldn't be uh, suitable. And I think for him as well, he likes the uh, relative strength of the FDM prints compared to resin, which can be a bit delicate. So that's one possible um, scenario. I think another scenario may be for model railway um, builders. Maybe if you've got small buildings and things which are further away from your viewpoint, so you're not going to see those layer lines, um, this could be quite a, a quick and cheap way so of building that kind watching, of scenery. And until next and time, kind of have fun modeling. So I think in many ways it is just a case of choosing the right tool for the job. For me, the right tool will be a resin printer, but I can see how other people would prefer a FDM printer. Anyway, guys, either way, do let me know what you think in the comments below. Personally, I've been having a lot of fun building this new diorama that you've seen in this video, and I will have a more in-depth build video of this coming shortly. I feel like I've got so many projects in progress at the moment, but some are falling uh, by the wayside almost. I know I still haven't done the Spitfire, and I really want to do the Spitfire, I just haven't quite got around to it yet. But I'm not starting new projects until I finish the ones that I am working on, so hopefully that Spitfire should be at the top of the list soon, even if it means it's the only thing on the list. Anyway guys, if you've made it this far, I would like to say thank you very much for watching. And as always, a special thanks to my YouTube members and Patreon supporters, whose invaluable support really makes a huge difference and is massively appreciated. Thank you very much, guys. If you do want to look at YouTube membership or Patreon membership, then the links are in the description below, as are the links to the 3D models which I printed on this, uh, in this video.